Every child dreams of growing up and becoming someone important. A doctor, a nurse, a pilot, a teacher. Role models in their community inspires this dream. For many children, these early imaginations are made more real and attainable when they enter school. In Ghana, the national policy on education says that every child should be enrolled in a school. But the reality is that some children will never have that opportunity. In some of the poorest communities in the country, children miss out on school because they are engaged in economic activities to help their parents. Like Hawini, who will join his older brother in the fields herding cattle. Or Charity, who dropped out of school because her mother couldn't afford it and needed help in the house. My name is Charity. When I wake up in the morning, I will wash my boots. I will sweep my room. I will fetch water. When I, I, I cook, when I finish cooking, I will go to the farm. When I come back, I will go and fetch water again. It is estimated that there are over 500,000 out-of-school children in Ghana and the reasons cover issues of poverty, cultural mindsets, societal attitudes and access. Access is, is one factor that appears to have left a lot of children out of school uh, to the extent that in some uh, communities which we describe as underserved, such children do not have schools. Because of inadequate resources, government is not able to reach every corner of the country. So in these far to reach areas, in these very remote rural areas, you would still find children that are unable to access formal education. A number of factors contribute to that. First of all, the distance. Some communities are remote and are cut off by natural barriers like rivers. There is no school infrastructure in these communities, forcing children to walk long distances to the nearest school. In many cases, they have to walk beyond three kilometers when they're under eight years of age, and sometimes over five kilometers when they're over eight. In terms of uh, access, particularly during the rainy season, it's, it's a problem getting to some of uh, the communities. And uh, besides that, some of the communities are settler communities, in which case they cultivate their crops, and when the land is exhausted, they move from that community to where the land is supposed to be fertile. So when even a school is uh, established in such a community, eventually they will desert that community and the school will become abandoned. So it's a problem establishing a permanent structure. When children have to walk long distances of over five kilometers to reach a school, then the chances of them dropping out are high. You know, in these communities where we have structural poverty, based on high levels of population growth, in most of the northern region, we have about six or seven children um, born to one woman. In households where we have three wives to one man, you have about 21 kids for one household. It is very difficult to get girls in school. Why? Because we have issues of fosterage. We also have issues of early marriage. More female children are given out in fosterage than the male child. Because the practice is normally when the woman is married, the woman comes along with a relative of hers into the marriage home. And so this child invariably becomes a foster child. And normally the female is, pre is, is preferred because she is coming to help the woman in household chores. So you will find out that there wouldn't be a single house that you would go into and would not get foster children. Ghana's pursuit of education for all 
started with the 1992 constitution. Universal basic education is trying to provide education to every child of school going age in the country so that access is not a problem. Cultural barriers should not be a problem. Socioeconomic background of people should not be a problem so that everybody has basic education. When you look at the FQ program, it indicated that 10 years after the implementation of that program, every child in Ghana ought to be in school. The FQ program started around 1996. So we're expecting that by 2006, every Ghanaian child should have been in school. But around 2003, we realized that a lot of children were not in school. So government then came up with various policies like the capitation grant and later the school feeding program, the free transport system, the free school uniforms, and all the other interventions which were aimed at making sure that every child goes back into school. But the research has shown that no matter the interventions you put into the system, the last 5% of children will need some special interventions for them to be able to go to school. So the complementary basic education program is aimed at mopping up all these children and putting them into school. This program was conceived jointly by the government and its development partners and by DFID to bring all children who for some reason have never been to school or have gone to school and dropped out back into the classroom. The first cycle has been successful and under the first cycle 24,000 uh, school children have been trained and integrated back into the formal system. Mm -hmm. The second cycle has begun with uh, the recruitment of about 55,000 mm -hmm. and is ongoing. Complementary basic education started originally in the 90s by the NGO School for Life. School for Life started as an NGO uh, working to uh, bring out of school children into school. Uh, and it started as an offspring of a friendship program between Ghana and Denmark. So out of this friendship, they began a development project. Uh, the first project was known as Ghanaian Danish Communities Program. And it was sited in Dalong, about 40 kilometers away from here. In the Tolong, now in the Kumungu district. They saw that our major problem was with education. Most of the children who were supposed to be in school were not in school. The boys were taking care of animals like cows, sheep, and all that. And because of that, they were not going to school. The girls were also helping their aunties and mothers in uh, looking after their siblings. Uh, and then hawking in the market, where they were markets, to sell things to support the family income. So they saw that if this trend continued, it meant that some children were virtually going to be out of school completely. They ask the question, how are we going to go around this dilemma? Because education is very important. And so, complementary basic education was born. Its main features included flexibility of school time to accommodate the chores children were doing for their parents. Our timetable is also uh, flexible. It's three hours. They will go around two o'clock and maybe close at five o'clock. So they can still go back to help their parents in household chores. Its greatest advantage was the ability to provide access to education to remote and underserved communities. Even under a tree, uh, classes can be organized. Each class has an enrollment of 25 learners. And the 25 learners, 13 of them are supposed to be girls and 12 boys. It is the mother tongue that we use to train them. All the materials that we have developed is in the mother tongue. The curriculum of the CBE methodology tries to bring into a nine-month cycle the first three years of the formal system. Just so that children of that age who have uh, overgrown school entry age can be prepared in a special way and so 
thereafter they can be integrated into the former school system. The School for Life methodology was so successful that donors began to push for it to become national policy. The GES under the Ministry of Education had to by itself carry out a study in 2006. We were very excited to see that take place. We didn't call for it, but they came in. And we said, huh. They went through their study, came out with a report, very positive for the system that uh, School for Life is running, came out with um, a concept paper that provided, that laid the foundation for the development of the whole policy. In this country, we have our FQ, the Free Compulsory Universal Basic Education, that enjoins every child to be in school. But we are also aware that it is not every child in, who is in school. Our recent population census demonstrates, for example, that Ghana has about half a million children who are out of school. This number came under a lot of discussion, but for us, we felt that even if the number was less, it still enjoined us to pay attention. So who are these children? Where are they? Why are they not in school? Even as we try to send the schools as close to the communities as possible, we are also very mindful that the children are growing. Now, they are not going to wait for your policies to be debated and for money to be accessed before they get education. So meanwhile, what do you do? And hence the importance of the complementary basic education. We felt very strongly that comprehensive basic education makes a really big uh, contribution to MDG2 in Ghana, um, and that's about uh, access to basic education. So at the moment, uh, Ghana has not met that MDG, but increasing access to primary education is critical to it. We decided to allocate a little over £17 million in 2012 um, initially for three to four years, but we have extended that now to 2018. Crown agents in collaboration with Associates for Change and CFBT were tasked with managing the scale-up of the CBE program. They constituted a management unit that engaged various partners to implement the program. The CBE program is in five regions and these are Upper East, Upper West, Northern Brangahafo and Ashanti region. Ashanti region has only one district, which is uh, Central Front Plains. But in total, we are operating in about 49 districts in those five regions. In cycle one, which is the 2013-2014 year, we targeted 25,000 learners. We were able to enroll about 24,117 learners. In cycle two, we targeted 55,000 learners, and we have been able to enroll about 54,500 learners. The plan is by the end of this program, we should have been able to put 200,000 out of school children back into school. We've had a long history of partnership, of uh, cooperation and collaboration. And this is the first time, though, that we considered an actual contribution to a particular program. And given that the CBE program has been doing such excellent work to help close the gap to reach the Millennium Development Goals, we worked with the Ministry of Education, consulted highly with them, consulted highly with the Ghana Education Service to see if this really was a good fit. Looking at the, the fact that the CBE program was going to end, uh, perhaps looking at how can we support the government to better sustain uh, the m management of this to make sure that we can help Ghana bridge the gap to reaching uh, universal primary education. The nine-month cycle of CBE events starts with the animation. So we had to do what we call the community animation. It's a sensitization activity to get communities to become aware and appreciate the need for children to be in school, one. Second, to see the need to support and allow their children to get enrolled on the CB project. Three, to provide the needed support for the children to go through the project to the end of the nine-month cycle as expected. Four, 
to provide support for the local facilitators who are going to be teaching these children in the project to the end. So all these things were spelled out during the community animation activity. The communities are given real responsibility for the success of the program through the local committee members, ensuring that they really own the program and are invested in its success. Every school in Ghana has what we call the school management committee members. But in the case of CBE, five members were selected from the existing school management committee members. Where there is no existing school in the community, the community will have to select five local committee members. And now these committee members make up the local governance structure, if I should put it that way. They will have to make sure the needed resources are mobilized by way of where the classes will be cited, who will teach the learners. Like I indicated earlier, this is a community-led project. So the committee itself selected a, a committed person, a youth, who is ready and understands the dynamics of the local language. You know, the project is taught in the local language, and that person will be prepared to teach the children in the nine months. These are the real heroes of the CBE program, young men and women who volunteer their time and commitment for the reward of seeing children from their communities given a chance at bettering themselves. Big John teaches a CBE class in the Atebubu district. We answer Adisuania or Krumha, Nadendi, Lejanian Juka, Mapas on Subakanka Krana, Yatino. Medindi Danso, Mamma, me, Renoir Adriani. A yes, sir, Wunya Adriani Paddy, na Wunya Apomodin. A yes, sir, Obiera Beddy Adriani are Adria Wom. I decided to be a facilitator because it's the community they choose me to be. Yes, I teach 25 children at the age of 8 to 14 years. And this year is my first year for teaching them. And I've completed SS from 2013. My father was a facilitator from the first starting of the uh, school for life. And now my father is not alive again. So I boast that. I have to feel my father promise from the village. That's why they started to, to teach the children from the village. Less than 30% of girls access primary basic education. The program strives for gender parity by giving preference to girls. During the animation to get communities to apply, what we did was that we just didn't do the animation and selected communities. The interested communities did put in application following the sensitization in the community, and we gave a criteria to be selected. And one of the criteria is such that a community that is able to identify and select a competent female has the chance to be selected amongst others. The rationale behind this is that we want to encourage more females to get on board. The five-member committee, you have three females and two males. In some cases, you have the females as chairpersons. And then, in, in that case, the children are motivated to also enroll, that we see our mothers managing this class. Then, the mothers also, in terms of counseling, I have visited a community where the females counsel the children from time to time. And so that is increasing the enrollment in terms of females. They also notice that the girl-child education, especially in these hard-to-reach areas, the rural areas, is so difficult that the parents by themselves will not be able to do it, and they have to be motivated in different ways. So they come up with different packages. So for example, they try to, if it's a female facilitator, they make sure that the female facilitator that is volunteering her services is given opportunity to continue her education. That way, there's a dual achievement of purpose in the sense that they are helping the girl achieve her aim of continuing her education and at the same time helping the program to ensure that more females are enrolled in the program. They serve as role models.
These children have benefited from the CBE methodology and reintegrated into the formal education system. <laughs> Once the kids have been trained and integrated, they are very happy and, and, and armed with a new confidence. They have they themselves are motivated enough to stay in school because once they were timid, now they are very confident and confidence helps a lot in staying in school. They realize that the parents also have noticed uh, the difference in their children. Now their children can read, their children can, can write, their children can count. The parents are now also very motivated to ensure that their children keep uh, uh, going to school. Sustaining the CBE program is a key objective for the drivers of this intervention. I think there are uh, two to three main elements. The first is physically ensuring that 200,000 children actually complete the CBE program. It's a nine month program and we want to make sure 200,000 children complete it. Um, originally our, our target was 120,000 but recently we've had additional funding from the US government which will allow us to target and support even more children through the process. The second was ensuring that um, CBE becomes a sustainable policy in Ghana. So we are seeking to build up the ministry's capability to deliver CBE uh, and also uh, encourage the ministry to make CBE part of its normal activities. We're having a pilot in some districts where we are planning for government to take on. So we want to try out how they would be able to manage the CBE program fully. We, we are helping them by doing a pilot and the, the, the team that we have in place are providing the necessary technical support and capacity building. What we're doing is to ensure that the program is sustained. And this will be sustained by looking at the role that the Ghana Education Service is playing right now, looking at the role that the donors are playing right now, and ensuring that in going forward, we are minimizing the roles the role of the donors and increasing the role of the Ghana Education Service to ensure that there's a smooth transition. We are going to involve even more closely the district assemblies and the district, assemb and the district directors of education who will be managing the program. And therefore we need to have them on board now, not when the program has ended. It is the mandate of the district assemblies uh, to help bring every child in the district into school. Because of the, the nature of the composition of the district education oversight committees, it is um, very important that if they are informed and if they are given a role to play, it is already their duty to create assets for every child in the district to come to school. If they are informed and if they are given a role to play, I think they will be very useful in this direction. The Ministry of Education is poised with Ghana Education Service where we will not even need donor support to provide because we have started now training the untrained teachers in the rural areas or the difficult to reach areas. So that is one area where they will serve at the difficult areas without even any cause when we send somebody and he says, oh, it's too difficult a place for me to go. There are already people there who we are training. My Maposuka. Lamambia Mandata and Zana Lola, meet my Zaman and me. The best uncle are the one I am not my name. 
la man bia la sen won tiang si kula na nan wa ma mit ma bia bo ma nenga me ma nda sen to na baade ma mit ma baade yel wu ba la yo ma bia la ba yo ma men de ken jam lo de ta bere pon kan ba de ya no re ma ni ya ta bia la ba la won tiang si ku ka ma ma pose ku zo 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 la ban ta yel sa ka wa son wa ma pose zo zo As we leave the Awisi community, the children sing a song that reflects the positive attitude they have towards the CBE program. They say, we have done our work, some will praise us, and some will insult us. But bye-bye, bye-bye.